You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. What is God's purpose for the world? Our source of information, as with other talks on this Gospel Online channel, will be the Bible which declares itself to be God's revelation to us. God's purpose is clearly stated in the early books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21, God declares, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. My quotations, by the way, are from the King James Version. So God's purpose with the world, simply stated, is to fill it with his glory. But what does that really mean? Well, there is a physical glory. The psalmist, for example, declares at the beginning of Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Here we have order, we have beauty, we have magnificence, a glory that mortal men and women cannot fully behold. For as the New Testament tells us, God dwells in light that no man can approach unto. But there is more to the glory of God than this. The Apostle Paul, for example, wrote to the Corinthians, do all to the glory of God. God's physical glory is not affected by anything that mortal men and women might do. So there has to be another aspect to the divine glory, a moral aspect, which can be affected in its manifestation on the earth by people's deeds. The dual aspect of God's glory is seen in a key incident where Moses asked to see it. I'd like to bring you to the book of Exodus and chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18, Moses says to God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And in his reply, the Almighty said to him, reading from verse 20, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. The physical glory here was so bright, it was so dazzling, that even Moses could not fully look upon it. And there is also in those verses an important principle for all to take note of, that we can only ever see where God has passed by. But we've missed out an important part of God's response to Moses, the other aspect of God's glory, and that's contained in verse 19, which says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. The glory then would be expressed in a character and a name. And this is expanded in the next chapter of Exodus, Exodus chapter 34, beginning at verse 5, where we read, The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Here then, set before us, is the majestic character of God. So it is the Almighty's purpose to fill the earth with his glory in both aspects. And those words from Numbers chapter 14 with which we began, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, are echoed and expanded as we continue reading through scripture. For example, later on in the prophecy of Isaiah, in the 11th chapter and verse 9, that prophet says, For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And then later on still, when we come to the prophecy of Habakkuk in chapter 2, verse 14, he declares, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And these Old Testament passages are bound together by a verse in the New Testament from the pen of the Apostle Paul, when he wrote his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4 and verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Those attributes of God which were revealed to Moses were ultimately shown forth in Christ, who is the moral image of God. This whole purpose of God 
is centered on Christ. And if we want to understand the glory of God, well, we need to look at him. He was the manifestation of his father. In other words, in his life, his character and his teaching, he perfectly revealed to men and women the character and the will of God. So he could quite rightly say, he that hath seen me hath seen the father. And I and my father are one as a way of expressing that perfect unity of mind and purpose that existed and indeed still does exist between the father and son. The Lord Jesus made his father's will his own and glorified him. In due time, he was raised from the dead, never to die again. And that is the pattern for others in the mercy of God. Human salvation, then, is indeed part of God's purpose for the world. The hope set before us lies principally in the person of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus. The Bible clearly teaches that having been raised from the dead, he subsequently ascended to heaven nearly 2,000 years ago to sit at his father's right hand. It is equally clear about the fact that he will personally return as king to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus spoke about this during his ministry. In his parable of the pounds, he likened himself to a nobleman who went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And having returned, he then called his servants to account. On another occasion, Jesus said to his disciples, for the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, we read about the Lord's ascension to heaven and the declaration that he would return and establish his father's kingdom. May I now bring you to the first chapter of the book of Acts and verse three, where we read that Jesus showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them, that is his apostles, 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after the Lord's resurrection, then he was with his disciples on earth for about six weeks, 40 days before he ascended to heaven. This verse in Acts tells us that the thing he particularly wanted to talk to his disciples about was the kingdom of God. But surely he'd been doing that for the past three years, hadn't he? Indeed, we know that his disciples had gone out and they preached the gospel of the kingdom. So why spend this short, valuable time speaking yet again about the kingdom of God? Well, the fact that the Lord Jesus wanted to do that tells us immediately how important the teaching about the coming kingdom really is. And of course, we know that there were aspects of the teaching that his disciples had not fully understood before, particularly about the Lord's own work in relation to the coming kingdom. In any event, they were so enthusiastic about what he had to say that when we get to verse six of Acts chapter one, they ask him, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? There had been a kingdom of God over Israel in Old Testament times, and the disciples knew that it was going to be restored on a much greater scale, and they wanted that kingdom to come immediately. And in the next verse, Jesus says to them that it was not for them to know the time. And so his followers to this day have to keep watching and waiting. We don't know the exact time. Then in the first chapter of Acts, the Lord Jesus ascends to heaven. And at that time, an assurance was given in verse 11 of that chapter, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Well, it could hardly be put in clearer language, could it? There is absolute certainty that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return at the time appointed by his father. Later, the apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And just before his death, the same apostle wrote to his young friend Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, with the assurance that henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So the Bible's teaching on this matter is very clear. Furthermore, although we don't know the exact time, we have reason to believe that the coming of the Lord Jesus may now be very near. When he was on earth before, he spoke to his disciples about the time just before his second coming. And the expressions that he used are so descriptive of the world of today. For example, in Luke chapter 21, he spoke about distress of nations with perplexity. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. The Lord spoke about a world that would be in turmoil, turmoil that only his coming could settle. 
However, in thinking about the Bible's solution to the world's problems, we must also remember to look at ourselves. The Bible tells us a great deal about ourselves and what it says isn't really very flattering. It teaches us that right from the time that Adam chose to break God's law back in the Garden of Eden, mankind has been under the curse of sin and death. And we only have to look around us today to see the outworking of human sin. There is widespread disregard for God and his ways. We see violence and depravity. It's a world of strife and we cannot restore ourselves to favour with God. However, happily for all of us, God himself has provided one particular way through the Lord Jesus Christ by which we can receive forgiveness of sins and have hope of eternal life. Christ laid down the conditions by which we can be saved. We find those conditions in the last chapter of Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, when he said, he that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. New Testament baptism was always, and New Testament baptism was always by full immersion, whereby we are said to put on Christ. And the belief that Jesus speaks about in verses 15 and 16 of that chapter is belief in the gospel that he preached, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And after he had ascended to heaven, his apostles went about and they preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. That kingdom hadn't come when the preaching took place, and it still hasn't come, but it will at the return of Christ from heaven. And all God's prophets of old are united in telling us that when the Lord returns, it will be to establish his father's kingdom. He will rule the earth from his capital city of Jerusalem. Just consider the words of one of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, who looked forward to this time. In the second chapter of his prophecy, he describes events that certainly haven't yet taken place. He's looking to the end of the age in which we are living. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3, we read, Many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isaiah there speaks about a great change that is going to come on the nations in the age to come. People will actually flow to Jerusalem, the capital of the kingdom, and they will want to learn of God's ways. This will also be a time when there is no more war, as Isaiah goes on to declare in the next verse. He says they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Those words of Isaiah are engraved on the wall facing the entrance to the United Nations building. Despite the best intentions, the UN has not been able to bring this situation about. But these words will finally become a reality under the rule of Jesus Christ. He will be a righteous, immortal, all-powerful king. Just what is needed to sort out the problems our world faces. The psalmist in Psalm 72 looked forward to the kingdom and he described it as a time of judgment and justice. He shall deliver the needy when he crieth, says the psalmist, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. People will not be left to grapple with problems that they cannot solve. Later, the psalmist speaks about corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains, an end to the world's food problems. The prophecy of Isaiah in the 35th chapter gives us a lovely picture of the coming kingdom. Isaiah says, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And shortly before, in the 32nd chapter of Isaiah, he also looked forward to this future time. And he said, behold, a king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. The work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Only when the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling the earth in righteousness will a world at peace be possible. It is then God's purpose to make this world once more very good as it was in the beginning. It will be a very different place to live under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will we choose to be part of this great purpose of God and be ready for Christ when he returns? Jesus said, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. This is the wonderful hope that is placed before us by the Bible. It's a hope that God has preserved through the ages and one that we can still respond to today. God's purpose for the world is to fill it with his glory and how thankful we should be that his purpose includes 
an offer of salvation for us, if only we are prepared to accept it. Please let us know what you think by posting a comment or question in the comment section of the Gospel Online channel. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen. Thank you.